Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. Hope you're all keeping safe and well. Uh, for this video, I thought I'd do something a bit different and do a bit more of a chatty video, really, because I wanted to mark the milestone that I've been working with my good friend Emily as a support worker for over a year now. And that's been going very well. We've been, we've been making good progress on that. And so I thought I'd tell you a bit about it and update you on how it's been going and things. So I haven't really talked about it much in video form. I've mentioned it in a blog kind of last year. I wrote a big blog post after I've been in the job for a couple of months. But I haven't really gone into it in detail since then. So I thought I'd let you know what I've been doing, how it's been going, that kind of thing, in case you're interested. Um, so, yeah, for those of you who don't know, I work as a support worker for Emily Davison, who runs the Fashionista blog and YouTube channel. And we've been friends for a long time since just before I moved to London. She was one of the first people I made a connection with online when I was looking at blogs and things like that and got involved in the whole blogging thing myself. So, yeah, she's known me for a while and I was made redundant um, a couple of years ago now. And around that time, Emily was starting her new job as a trainee journalist with a company called NewsQuest. And she knew, you know, I was looking for work, so I put myself out there and she approached me and asked her if I wanted to be her support worker, which I was very happy to do. Um, you know, having obviously gone to Access to Work to see what salary they were going to offer me. Obviously, I didn't just blindly accept the job, no pun intended. But, you know, we, we did consult with Access to Work and they offered actually a very fair wage. I'm not going to say what it is, but they offered a better wage than I was expecting. And it's a very fair wage for the amount of work that I do. And I started working for about... Uh, two months after Emily first contacted me. So that bit kind of went through pretty quickly from Emily first contacting me to me actually starting to work with her. It was about two months and that included Christmas and New Year in the way as well, which obviously slowed things down a bit. So that's quite impressive. But obviously overall for Emily, it took a long time to get all the support she needed in place, not just me, but technology and travel support and stuff like that. Um, because access to work does have quite a slow turnaround time. It's well worth it. It's well worth claiming the support but it can take a while to get it. And I know RNIB and other charities have been kind of asking the DWP to speed things up. But yeah, it is a very good and useful scheme um, when you get it. But yeah, I started off doing 22 hours a week. And over the years, that has gradually expanded. And I'm now doing, as of January this year, a full 37 hours a week. So that's gone up quite a lot. Um, which is great for me. It means I'm working full time again, basically. And based on the wage I've been offered from Access to Work, it's actually a bit more than I was earning in my previous job in total, which is lovely. And the hours have expanded because, you know, both of our experiences kind of improved as Emily's got better at her job and learned more about it. And I've obviously got more into the role and taken on more work for her, um, which I'll get on into in a minute, the sort of things I do. It also means I've had to become self-employed, um, you know, so I actually have my own trading name. Well, well, I never. The name of this blog is now also my trading name with HMRC. Um, so I have to do a tax return every year, a self-assessment tax return, which was very easy last year. And I didn't have to pay any tax last year because you know, I'd only been working for a couple of months by that point. But it'd be interesting to see how much tax I end up paying this year. Obviously, I can take off some expenses. Um, you know, you can, you can claim flat rate expenses for home working, which I'm doing to keep it simple. You can also really go deep into it and calculate very precisely your different bills and divide them up by the number of rooms and the hours you work or whatever. That gets very complicated, might be better for some people. But for me, in a very basic position, you know, I don't have any major overheads. I just use my normal computer to do the work anyway. So I use these flat rate expenses and just add on other little bits that I might buy, like printer rings if I need to print out stuff or particular software I've had to buy um, or subscribe to to use um, to help Emily with her job. And in terms of claiming the money back from access to work, um, I invoice Emily once a month. I have to raise an official invoice, which is easy to do. I used to create invoices in my old job, so I basically just based the template off that, really just reproduce that because I could remember what it looked like. Um, and... Yeah, I'd be basically send it off to Access to Work with confirmation from her employer and a claim form. Um, originally, to start with, we had to fill out a paper claim form. You basically fill in every date I've worked and the hours on those dates I've worked and how much the total I'm charging her is for it. And then we used to post that off. Um, it had been signed by Emily and her employer and all got posted off. Um, we were able to kind of do it electronically because we're all in different places. Um, you know, I work from home, Emily works from the office or her house. Um, so, yeah, well, I was able to set it up on a website called DocuSign, um, which is one of the things I had to pay a subscription for. And so, yeah, I could kind of fill out the form and then pass it to Emily and her employer to fill in. Then I can print it off and kind of send it off with the invoice on her behalf then. Um, so doing it that way meant that the payments were fairly slow because obviously the post has got to go through and they've got to manually enter the information. So it took about three to four weeks, um, sometimes a little bit longer than that, to get the payments. It did come, you know, but it did take a little while. Um, but now, as of like midway through last year, in the summer last year, they started doing it online. 
Um, they finally launched an online portal, which is long, long overdue. Um, so we're able to use that now, and Emily can just you know upload the invoice to that and keep track of the payment. You know, so the payments have been much quicker as a result of that. The first payment took like thirteen days, and then the next couple took like six days each from the moment we submitted it to me getting the payment. Since then, in December and January, it's been slower um, because of Christmas and New Year. They've probably been understaffed, which is fair enough. It's been going back to about three weeks again, but hopefully it'll speed up a bit again now. But we'll see. As long as I get the payments, it's fine. You know, Emily can track them online anyway. So it, it's it's working out nicely. I'm earning a good wage. I'm doing good hours again. It's nice to still be in work, really. You know, I got very lucky having been made redundant. You know, I didn't expect to get a job that quickly and certainly not a job working with someone I get on very well with as a good friend. I was very, very lucky. The timing just fell in my favour. So I'm very blessed by that. And so there are two aspects to the job, essentially. Um, Mondays are Emily's diploma day because she's studying a journalism diploma alongside the work she's doing. So Mondays we attend classes. Um, so they're online classes, obviously. They're on uh, Google Meets. And they're run by Darlington College. And so we have groups of us attending each class. And the tutors are very nice and they're, they're good people. And they're quite happy for me to sit in. I just sit in quietly in the background and just take notes. A lot of it is basically just copying from the slides they put on screen and then just kind of annotating them with any other things they add. And then I kind of transform them later on into like revision sheets that Emily can like look at. So I organise them to proper headings and bullet points with the key information that she needs and not all the fluff surrounding it. Um, so it helps her to then revise for the exams and things. You know, I don't attend exams with her. Obviously, she does them all by herself. She has extra time, of course. But yeah, she uses my notes to advise from along with her textbooks and the slides themselves and they have mock exam papers online and things like that. So it all works out nicely. She's been getting very good grades for the modules she's done so far. There's also coursework she has to do as well, um, which I don't tend to get involved with. Um, there was one um, post she wrote on her blog, a big post about um, accessibility in the beauty industry. I looked up a little bit of information for her on that and helped check it a bit, but Ultimately, it was all our own work and very impressive it was too. Um, there's some photography coursework she had to do as well and there was a portfolio of work she had to put together from her actual news reporting she's been doing. Um, the one bit of coursework I had sort of involvement with was uh, her video coursework she had to do. She had to conduct um, a couple of video interviews and we interviewed, or she interviewed, um, a lady called Taylor Notcut, who is a singer and a blind singer and very nice lady and congratulations to her on her recent engagement not that she'll be watching this but if she does congratulations um and so yeah we got to meet her a couple of times so the first time we met her was in danson park and that was when she was looking for a guide dog and then later on we met her in the glade shopping center in bromley where she had a new guide dog by then very adorable and Emily interviewed her as part of her beauty accessibility project. You can find the um, video in uh, Emily's blog post. And if you watch the video, you'll see me as a little cameo in the background looking after Emily's dog outside the shop they are in. Because the thing about me going to help Emily with that coursework is it's partly to kind of help keep track of the shots she wants. She'll give me a list of the shots that she wants to do. And I keep track and make sure she's got them all. And I'll carry some equipment for her. But a big part of what I do is looking after Rosie, her guide dog. So I get to kind of just sit with the dog for an hour or whatever and just pet the dog and just look after her make sure she's not lonely she still gets a bit whiny obviously because she wants her mum she wants Emily but um, she's quite happy being with me she always loves seeing me Rosie whenever I turn up for our socialising and stuff so yeah I get paid to dog sit an adorable Labrador for an hour so <laughs> can't complain about that that's uh, definitely a perk of the job and the modules that Emily has had to do have included things like essential journalism which covers the basics like ethics and interview techniques and finding stories and where to find information that kind of thing and then there was obviously the video a journalism bit she did. I had to take a few notes for that initially about, you know, types of shots you need to get and editing tips and stuff like that. But mostly that was all her own work anyway for the coursework part of it. And then the photo stuff, I didn't really have any much involvement with at all, really. Just a few basic notes at the beginning to set it up and that was it. Um, there was a law and regulation course as well, which covered obviously a lot of stuff like defamation and contempt of court and, you know, dealing with, you know, children and youth courts and things like that. And then at the moment, we're doing a couple of new modules um, which are court reporting, which has some overlap with the law module. And then there's also public affairs, which includes like public finances, public services, government, the monarchy, health service, that kind of thing. Um, and they're quite dry subjects, admittedly, um, but you know, it's important things to know. Um, and for me, it's nice to be able to sit in on a course and not have to study it. I can just kind of you know watch it and take some notes for Emily, but I don't have to kind of retain any of it and remember it. Some of it is sinking in by osmosis, naturally, by sitting there. And some of it I have found it useful to remember for my job, for my role that I do, because it's important to know some of the important information. 
Um, but I haven't had to remember a lot of it. A lot of the final details just gone completely. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of nice to be able to kind of get a free lesson and a free insight into what journalists have to learn and do. I don't think I'd want to be an actual journalist myself. I don't think I'd be cut out for that actual job. But the job I'm doing in assisting a journalist is it's good. It's Obviously, it's rewarding for me knowing that Emily is succeeding, knowing that I'm, I'm helping another disabled person to succeed. Indeed, access to work in paying kind of Emily and funding Emily's career, basically funding two disabled people, myself and her, to be in a job at the same time for the price of one claim. I could even claim access to work myself, in fact, for the work that I do, because you can claim access to work if you're self-employed. I don't need to because I use my Mac to do all the work. I work from home and everything's set up the way I need to. But, you know, in theory, I could apply for access to work, you know, as well as them paying me for my invoices to Emily. That'd be quite confusing, wouldn't it? So in terms of the other work that I do, though, on the other days, um, it's mainly kind of nine to five work most of the time. Um, where we just kind of do whatever stories kind of Emily wants to do or our editors suggested and things like that. You know, I I think the important thing to say, not that it needs saying, but, you know, my job isn't to give Emily an unfair advantage. You know, it's just to bring her up to the level of what a regular journalist does. So I don't come up with story ideas. You know, I don't write stories. I don't do interviews. You know, I don't do all that. I don't do all the creative stuff like that. You know, she does the core journalism part of it. My role is to kind of gather information and format it in a way that's accessible for her and to check things over things like that maybe put images together like the really visual jobs like that put charts together things like that but she's the one who's kind of deciding stories along with her editor and you know writing them and interviewing people and really digging into the core stuff of it and she's very good at it she's definitely been improving more and more you know she had a very solid start to begin with but she's definitely been making good progress over the year which is fantastic we work nine to five most days um, and that's kind of general work. We might cover a bit of breaking news here and there or whatever other stories Emily's had ideas to do or reviews that she does for things. There's quite a variety of things, as you can imagine, that you have to write about. Um, but sometimes we do early shifts, which are kind of shifted two hours earlier. So we do like seven till three. And, and then sometimes we do a weekend shift, which is nine to five hours, but a weekend on a Saturday and Sunday. Um, and in the case of early shifts and weekend shifts, it's more a focus on looking around for what's out there because there's much fewer staff in the office. It's pretty much like just us covering our local area and one or two other colleagues covering other areas of London, things like that. So we're keeping an eye out for breaking news stories, either before people come in on weekdays or just when other people aren't around at weekends. I mean, the editor is always accessible. Emily can always contact her editor and you know, get approval on stories and ask questions and things. But ultimately, you know, you're kind of there monitoring things. So we're looking for things like, you know, like traffic incidents and you know, crimes that police are kind of issuing statements on and you know, weather, weather warnings and things like that and you know, travel disruption on the trains and um, just anything else that's breaking on social media or in other places that we look at. There's quite a lot of different places. I've got a kind of a long list of links that I go through when I'm monitoring things and you know, I've kind of become more organised in that respect in, kind of, in terms of how I look for things. You know, there's lots of places I can look for stories to try and find things for Emily to cover. Obviously, she's looking as well and she can also do a lot of the stuff Stuff that she asks me to do but obviously it's quicker for me to do a lot of this stuff and so yeah I look around for a lot of information but um, in terms of other general work you know it is things like proofreading it's for searching for information on whatever Emily needs um, transcriptions are a common thing as well when she does interviews I will transcribe the audio into text form um, that is done you know largely through a bit of software that I've bought called Whisper Transcription or Mac Whisper and yeah, that's a really useful bit of software, actually, and it's been developing quite nicely. It uses AI and you know converts the speech into text, not 100% perfectly, but it is pretty accurate. You know, I've put it on kind of the best quality settings, which is a bit, a bit slower, but it's pretty accurate. I still have to then listen to the whole recording through and just correct little mistakes. So it still takes a little while to do in terms of the initial processing and then my going through it. But it's a lot quicker than me having to type things out by hand, which is laborious. It's tiring on the eyes and it just takes a lot longer. So I'm glad I've been able to speed that up with software, um, which really does help. And I've been using that for my YouTube captions as well. Um, it's just really helpful. So yeah, I'm glad I found that. And yeah, in terms of other things I use, I mean, for images that we kind of put together, you know, we put together, you know, we resize images for the header 
of each article that she does. And sometimes it's a single image, we just resize it to a certain size. Sometimes it's like two, three or four images merged together in some way. Um, and so we use a website called Canva for that. It's a nice, easy kind of image editor. There's a lot of functionality in there and it's completely free. Um, you know, there is a, obviously a paid level as well, but the free functionality is more than adequate. So yeah, I've got templates set up in there for the most common layouts that we use. And whenever Emily wants me to do something, I'll just pick up the appropriate template and just pop the images into it that we're using at that time and export it and that can go in the article. Um, in terms of other visuals, charts are another one that we do as well. You know, if, if there's data, then I can kind of manipulate the spreadsheets and pull out what she needs. Um, because I'm used to doing that for my old job with mail merges and things. So, you know, I, I like using spreadsheets. It kind of keeps me busy to kind of do stuff like that. So, yeah, I put out data, I reorganise it, and you know, sometimes I'll just put it in a chart that Emily can stick in a, her article or I'll convert it into like bullet points that she can then use to write her article as well, stuff like that. So, yeah, it's quite nice to be able to visualise stories with charts and things. Now and again, we'll, I'll also put maps together as well. Google will have a maps feature where you can like pinpoint items on a map. Like, you know, like if you're looking for certain restaurants or pubs or attractions or things or whatever, then you can kind of mark them on a map and embed that map in the article. So there's lots of little tools out there like that that we use. And obviously there's sources we can use for certain images as well, either directly from um, certain you know, places, businesses we can request images from and get permission, or there are other places we can source images online as well. So... Yeah, a lot of the image stuff, obviously, I help her with because when you can't see very well, that's obviously very difficult. And, you know, looking at things like, you know, looking at things like traffic cameras and, you know, maps for you know, road incidents, that's quite difficult with voiceover as well. So, yeah, I help with all that too. So it's quite a wide range of work that I do, you know, in, in terms of kind of information hunting and you know, proofreading things and transcriptions and images and all this kind of stuff. You know, it soon adds up and it does make the day go nice and quick. There's always stuff for Emily. You know, that I can do you know she doesn't put too much pressure on me she doesn't overload me you know she's got a very good sense of you know what I can keep up with because obviously I'm visually impaired as well so I'm not as quick as a regularly sighted person would be but I'm quick enough for what she needs thankfully so yeah we're kind of working together kind of building on each other's strengths really you know there are some things she can see a bit better than me when we go out sometimes um, you know, just because of the, the way our vision is different overall her sight is more uh, severe in terms of how much sight loss she has but you know, there are still things that she can do better than me in some ways. So yeah, Emily and I get on very well and I get on well with our colleagues too, you know, what little interaction I have with them, you know, it, but I do have access to their Microsoft 365 network that they collaborate in so I can chat to Emily on Teams and occasionally I kind of poke my head into group conversations if I'm, you know, needed or whatever. Um, so I have said hello to her colleagues and I've spoken to her editor as well, um, you know, when we do catch-ups and things and how Emily's doing and um, I have access to email as well and uh, OneDrive for storing files. So I've got a kind of nice kind of folder hierarchy that I store things in for Emily, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that's good. They've kind of allowed me in as a freelancer. That's what I've been termed as, which is fine. Um, because that's what I am effectively because I'm not employed by NewsQuest as I've said it's access to work that pay me it's the government that pay me not NewsQuest I'm not an employer of theirs Emily has kind of employed me in a way um, you know I'm I'm, off, well, I'm offering a service so you know, Emily is making use of that service I'm charging her for it access to work and making the payment for that service that I'm providing um, so yeah it's, it works nicely on you know all round you know it doesn't cost NewsQuest any extra for me to be on board and it means that, you know, Emily is able to make the most of her skills to work, you know, with them and for them. And then the other nice aspect to Emily's job is that she gets PR invites to go and review things. So she gets free meals at restaurants and free tickets to theatre shows and attractions and things like that. She gets to go and stay at places sometimes. So she even went to Rhodes in Greece last year, for instance, which was very nice for her. So, yeah, she's very lucky in that respect, as are her colleagues who also get similar perks, of course. And, you know, all reviews have to be your honest opinions. So, you know, if you don't like something, you've got to be tactful about it, but honest, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I mean, she only tends to accept things that she knows she's probably going to like anyway, you know. So, um, yeah, it, it, she has had some very nice things out of that. And she is sometimes able to invite a plus one along, you know, to go and have a meal with her or to go to a theatre show, things like that. And I have been the plus one sometimes, you know, she's invited me along to some nice meals which we've had together and some nice attractions we've been to. You know, we've been to London Zoo for an evening visit there and we just recently been to Battersea Power Station and seen the view from up in the chimney up there as well, which is really impressive. 
So yeah, I'm very grateful to her for that. And she's very fair at sharing these kind of freebies out amongst her family and friends, which is only right and proper. You know, I, I wouldn't want to hog everything by any means, but it's nice that she invites me along to thank me for the work I do for her. And just as a social thing, you know, we get on well socially too. So it's a good opportunity to kind of meet up and catch up on things. But we also do meet up generally and do other things ourselves anyway. So yeah, that's another nice perk of the job that getting some free meals and things. I've enjoyed some very nice meals with her and yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what other things come up this year. There's already one thing I know is coming up in March, which sounds quite uh, different and interesting. There's a meal, but there's something rather unusual attached to that meal, which is uh, going to be quite fun, I think. Um, definitely something that I've never done before and people might be surprised to see me doing, but um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, as I say, it's a nice perk to the job and a nice kind of reward for the job as well. So again, it's one of these things that makes the job worthwhile. And then finally, just for fun, I thought I'd mention what I listen to while I'm working as well. Um, you know, I don't just sit here in silence. You know, I do listen to music as well. I like to have that on in the background um, because I can do that working from home. I'm not in an office. I'm not disturbing anyone else. So why not? Um, you know, and I've tried listening to different things over the years since I started homeworking, since I moved to London. You know, I've listened to podcasts as well. I've kind of tried listening to them when I'm working and they're good, but I can't really focus on them. You know, if I want to hear something interesting that someone's saying, I can't be kind of reading or typing things at the same time. I can't kind of focus on both of those things. There were things I used to miss and one or two podcasts kind of came to an end anyway. Um, so I just kind of drifted to music and listened to that and tried a few different stations. But ultimately, these days, I listen to BBC Sounds because it's free. You know, it's part of the licence fee, obviously, but it is ultimately free. And there's a good selection on there and there's no adverts. But the advantage, of course, of doing this online is that you're not reliant on the schedule. Um, you, know, you can just listen to whatever show you want when you like these days, which is great. So I listen to a lot of stuff from BBC Radio 2. I listen to Pick of the Pops, of course, and Sounds of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And they've also got a nice selection of 90s shows now as well, which is relatively recent. Only in the past few years they've started doing those. But as someone who grew up in the 80s and 90s, it's nice to listen to some of that stuff for nostalgia. You know, my favourite decades are more like the 70s and 80s, really. But there's some good stuff in the 90s as well. And it is good to listen back to some of that. So there's Sounds of the 90s and Dance Sounds of the 90s and Alternatives sounds in the 90s they're all good and then there's things like johnny walker's rock show as well and the kitchen disco hosted by sophie ellis bexter and there's a show called the good groove hosted by dj spoonie which kind of has some 90s mixes in it which is good but he also plays dance music from across the decade as well so not all of it necessarily appeals but a lot of it does so i'm happy to listen to that and then there's also a nice show called the piano room as well which for this series is hosted by vernon k it's a 20 part series and in each short episode it's only about 20 minutes per episode a different artist performs with the bbc concert orchestra on a classic track of theirs and then a new song and then they do a cover as well so that's quite nice they've had a nice variety of artists on there for instance the first episode had Bruce Hornsby who did The Way It Is as his classic of course as well as a couple of other nice tracks and then there's also a programme I found that is exclusively on BBC Sounds not on the radio called Pace Setter which is designed for runs and workouts it's basically a series of two hour mixes that you can use for your runs or your exercise whatever but I just listen to it in the background so it's a nice kind of mix of kind of pop and rock and dance and R&B tracks again not every single track appeals to me necessarily but it's just a good mix to have in the background because there's no presenter there then and it's just continuous music for a couple of hours so yeah those are the sort of programs I listen to and there's one or two others that pop up now and again and there's occasional special mixes that BBC Sounds do now and again too that are quite good so I'm always keeping an eye out for what's on there and they recommend things anyway based on what I'm listening to that I tend to like so yeah it's nice to explore that there's a lot on there compared to like the old days when it wasn't you know very interesting on there sometimes there's a nice bit of variety on there I find anyway for me personally and it accompanies a nice variety of work that I do as well you know I am very blessed to have this job every day is different I'm always kept busy but not overwhelmingly so you know there is a very steady pace to it I can always keep up with it and Emily is always you know very generous if I need to you know take a bit things a bit slower because I'm feeling ill or whatever that's fine likewise you know when she's ill she has to take things a bit slower so yeah we have a very good friendship there we get on very well we trust each other and yeah I'm just very grateful for you know the opportunity to do a job like this it is very rewarding and i know she's very grateful to me so it works out very nicely and we'll see what the future holds you know she's doing very well with her qualifications and with her job so you know the future is looking very promising and very interesting and we will see how things develop and yeah i'll keep you posted here and there um but yeah, I hope you found that interesting. I hope you found that interesting as a little insight into this. I've written a blog post to go with it as well. So there are probably things in there that I haven't said here. Um, but um, 
yeah, I just thought I'd give you that insight, really, just to celebrate, you know, as I say, the milestone of working for Emily for a year. And that has flown by, absolutely flown by. So, yeah, that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about, really. Um, thank you very much if you've been watching that. Um, you know, I do appreciate you taking the time to watch these videos, these ramblings. I'll be back for another regular monthly update at the, you know, in early March, like I normally do, to cover the second half of January and all the you know, little bits I've done in February. It's not going to be a terribly busy post this time around. You know, it's been much more relaxed at the start of the year, but that's good. There's still little things to mention. But in the meantime, um, yeah, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And I will see you for another video very soon. Bye for now.